Hello everyone, and welcome to the 85th episode of Analyzing Evil, featuring Dexter Morgan from Dexter. The story of Dexter Morgan is one of tragedy and heartbreak. In this story, we find a man whose very beginnings were massacred beyond repair. The sad tale of a child caught in a traumatic experience that sends him careening down a path of darkness, a journey into the shadowy recesses of murderous behavior that's only worsened by the actions of those closest to him. Dexter is an anti-hero, a villain for villains, and in a certain light, what Dexter does in this series can be seen as quite heroic, but when one shines an even brighter light upon Dexter Morgan, labeling him as a hero becomes a dubious proposition at best. In this video, we're going to explore everything that made Dexter the monster hunting monster that he is, and in the process, divining whether or not that quasi-noble pursuit is something worth praising or condemning. And when we've covered all there is to know about Dexter, we'll be able to safely decide whether or not we can label Dexter as being evil. To do that, we'll of course be looking at the TV series and its reprisal show, Dexter, New Blood, but we'll also be using a bit of information from the web miniseries, Dexter Early Cuts, as well. What we won't be covering in this video are the Dexter novels, as although the first season of the show follows the first book closely enough, the rest of the entries in that series are an entirely different story, and Dexter might as well be a completely different character in the books. If you're interested in a video covering Dexter as he appears there, let me know down below, and I'll cover him at a later date. But before we begin, let's first talk about our sponsor for this video, Morning Brew. I'm sure many of you are like me, and find yourself scrolling aimlessly through social media, only to find that you've been doing so mindlessly without ever encountering anything remotely interesting or educational. Morning Brew, a free daily newsletter, is the perfect way to break that unfortunate habit. Morning Brew provides you with up-to-date information on business, finance, and tech in just five minutes, providing you with an alternative to the bland and boring popular news outlets with their witty, relevant, and informative daily newsletters. I've learned quite a bit about the current state of the stock market through Morning Brew, and I love being able to digest all the important tech news that comes out on a daily basis in minutes. Morning Brew is a great source of information to start your day with, and you can begin receiving your daily Morning Brew completely free by going to morningbrewdaily.com file or by clicking the link in the description. So don't wait, get access to news that matters through Morning Brew by going to morningbrewdaily.com file or by clicking the link down below. Thank you, Morning Brew, for sponsoring this video. Now, without further ado, let's begin. Dexter Morgan was born Dexter Moser on February 1st, 1971, to Laura Moser and Joe Driscoll. For the first three years of his life, Dexter was cared for by his mother, Laura, and though it seemed to have been a relatively happy time in his life, as we see in several flashbacks during the first season, we don't have too much information about Dexter during this time in his life. However, that was an entirely different person, a child that died so Dexter Morgan could be born on October 2nd, 1973, the day that his mother was murdered in front of him in a shipping container with a chainsaw. Forced to sit in a pool of his mother's blood as she was hacked to pieces, Dexter along with his brother were traumatized beyond the point of no return, permanently altering both of their psyches. To what degree, though, is a matter of debate. Because of Dexter's activities and his lack of emotion in certain scenarios, it's easy to jump to the diagnosis of antisocial personality disorder. However, there are a few things to consider here that may alter our view of Dexter's mental health, and it begins with his aforementioned transformation into Dexter Morgan. Now, Dexter's parents were involved in some sort of illegal activities that involved drugs, and it was this criminal lifestyle that brought Laura Moser, Dexter's mother, to the attention of Officer Harry Morgan. Taking her under his wing as a confidential informant and as a mistress, Harry was using Laura to provide information to him about a group of drug lords she was involved with. Just prior to the horrifying incident in the shipping container, Harry was setting up a sting operation that was meant to be the final nail in the coffin for these men, and Laura was apprehensive about engaging in this affair because she feared that they were onto her. But Harry persisted and managed to convince her to cooperate, which would end up causing Laura's death. This is the first sin Harry committed in regard to Dexter's life, as if he had just listened to Laura and not pushed her into participating in this operation, she would still be alive and this willingness to endanger the life of another person is quickly followed by a second sin, abandoning Brian Moser to the foster care system because he feared the monster he might become. But to atone for these mistakes, he chose to take in Dexter as one of his own, which is quite the noble thing to do, despite the aforementioned sins. However, whatever nobility can be found in Harry's willingness to raise Dexter as a member of his family is shattered by how he handles the trauma that Dexter has suffered. 
From the moment he took Dexter in, Harry feared that Dexter would eventually show signs of antisocial personality disorder and inevitably become a serial killer. And as time went on, he began to suspect that his fears were indeed becoming a reality due to Dexter's lack of emotion, along with the odd, grotesque drawings he would create. But he was given confirmation that his suspicions were correct when he discovered that Dexter had begun killing small animals at the age of seven. Now, because of his experience dealing with serial killers and murderers as a police officer, Harry believed that there was no hope of Dexter ever living a normal life. So fearing what his son might become, Harry sought the help of a colleague, Dr. Evelyn Vogel, an expert on serial killers and psychopaths. With her help, he developed the code, a set of rules for Dexter to live by so that he could act on his urges in the safest and most moral way possible, instead of repressing them and possibly causing further harm to himself and others in the long run. And that code basically boils down to giving Dexter the restriction of only killing people who deserve to be killed. Now this is the greatest sin that Harry ever committed against Dexter in his lifetime, as he immediately jumped to the most extreme conclusion in regard to Dexter's condition, and he chose to teach him to kill correctly rather than attempt to treat him in any other way. And this decision seems to have been heavily influenced by Dr. Vogel, a woman who is likely a psychopath herself as much as she is a quack. Vogel sought to use Dexter as a vessel to confirm her theory that serial killers are a remnant of the alpha wolf a societal necessity that we should be encouraging instead of suppressing. And by doing so, she utterly destroyed any hope Dexter had of living a normal life. When Harry discovered Dexter's condition, he could have done everything in his power to ensure that Dexter developed into a well-adjusted adult. Therapy, encouragement of healthy social interaction, mentorship, or anything else that you can think of that's necessary for a child to develop into a functioning member of society are things Harry could have done to help his son overcome his condition rather than classifying it as an inevitability. And Harry actually did provide Dexter with a relatively stable home life. Sure, the Morgan household went without pets because of Dexter's condition. Dexter had to fake much of his emotions, and it seems that Harry might have been more focused on his work and extramarital activities than he was on his children. But otherwise, Dexter grew up in a healthy environment, surrounded by people who loved him. As we see later on in the series when Dexter is experiencing hallucinations of his father, we see this fantasized version of Harry admitting that he only focused on the darkness within Dexter and never bothered with the light. And while this manifestation of Harry is all in Dexter's head, this fictitious confession holds a lot of weight, as by all accounts, Dexter had plenty of light within him when he was younger that could have easily allowed him to overcome the limitations placed upon him by the trauma he suffered. This light mostly manifests in his love and devotion to Deb and the inner turmoil within him when his father tells him that he is who he is and there's no way around it. But regardless, the feelings he has for her and the inner torment he experienced when finding himself as a youth are no fabrication. And these feelings, as well as many other tender feelings Dexter displays throughout the series, serve as a strong indicator that it would be erroneous to categorize Dexter as someone who is totally and inevitably lost to the darkest depths of antisocial personality disorder. Dexter does display a few symptoms of this disorder, namely persistent lying or deceit to exploit others, using charm or wit to exploit others, criminal behavior, lack of empathy for others, and lack of remorse about harming others. Though this symptom is only a partial one, considering he does show some remorse at points and a good amount of empathy towards those close to him. But here's the thing, every disorder has a spectrum attached to it. When it comes to Dexter, I do believe that he suffers from ASPD to an extent, but it's not the whole story of Dexter Morgan, and the ASPD he does suffer from is an incredibly strange form. Throughout this series, we are consistently given indicators that are meant to challenge our view of Dexter as a psychopath, namely in his better-than-average ability to blend into society, the many empathic feelings he displays towards those close to him, and the constant inner struggle he experiences due to never truly feeling quite at home as a serial killer or as an ordinary Joe. I think it's much more likely that the suppression of his PTSD caused certain traits and behaviors associated with ASPD to manifest themselves within Dexter, and Harry and Dr. Vogel's further exacerbation of these symptoms made it so Dexter developed a sort of fabricated ASPD that only hid what he was actually suffering from. If Dexter hadn't been encouraged to fit the role of a psychopathic serial killer, I think we'd be able to label him as someone suffering from schizophrenia, schizotypal personality disorder, alexithymia, or even autism. The way Dexter behaves in his everyday life aligns much more closely with certain aspects of these disorders, and you can find symptoms of these disorders within Dexter constantly throughout the series, like his hallucinations, his social awkwardness, his low level of emotional intelligence, his depression, and his meticulous nature. You could call him an autistic, antisocial, schizotypal, alexithymic, schizophrenic, 
But at the end of the day, Dexter is a fictitious character who was created with an amalgamation of different traits and behaviors that make his character work, and there likely isn't any specific diagnosis that can be given to him. Regardless, the biggest takeaway here is that Dexter is a person caught between many different personas. Dexter Moser, Dexter Morgan, father, husband, brother, friend, serial killer, vigilante, all of these things are a part of who Dexter is, yet each one of these aspects is missing something that doesn't allow Dexter to fully embrace any of these roles, and we're often privy to Dexter's struggle to discover who he is, whether that be from his own exposition and actions, or through the hallucinations he experiences of his father, brother, and sister, or otherwise. Had he not been told constantly that there was a monster living inside him when he was younger, with the help of therapy and his average family life, might have turned out to be a completely normal person. But Dexter turned out just as you'd expect a person would when you condition them into becoming a serial killer from an early age. The adult Dexter is, to put it broadly, odd. He has extreme difficulty interacting with others on an emotional level, and any interaction he does have with people is faked more often than not. But his fake personality is charming, witty, and personable and he has no problems performing exceptionally well at work or in other group settings. However, he has little to no expression outside of these false displays, and the real Dexter is bland, boring, and cold. A man who struggles to identify what he enjoys doing in his free time because the only thing he does enjoy is killing other people. However, his own personal emotions are also heavily suppressed, as we see whenever there's a moment where Dexter is so utterly distraught that he's close to tears, but because of everything that he's experienced and been taught about himself, he can't bring the unfeeling monster that he believes himself to be to express any kind of meaningful emotion. He's closed off to most human interaction, partly because of his damaged emotional intelligence, but also because he fears what would happen if anyone discovered the real Dexter, his so-called dark passenger, a part of Dexter that he eventually recognizes as an integral part of himself and not some other entity outside of his control. He's apprehensive about entering into close relationships with other people because he worries that his lack of emotion and empathy will over time cause those people to distance themselves from him, which is yet another obstacle blocking Dexter from living an average life. He does love kids though, and for the most part, they seem to love him back, and it's because he's much more comfortable around children than adults because there's far less social interaction between them that could go wrong. He's also incredibly intelligent and unnaturally calm in all dire situations he finds himself in, so much so that he's able to outsmart and outmaneuver nearly everyone he comes in contact with with his cold objectivity, keen attention to detail, and unwavering disposition. Now much of who Dexter is encompasses a carefully crafted persona that's meant to allow him to blend into society, and we see quite a lot of this fabricated Dexter. But when do we get to see the real one? Well, whenever he's out on a kill, or when he's interacting with the people that he loves, or when he's attempting to form a connection with someone. Deb is an obvious one, as Dexter genuinely cares for his sister more than anyone he's ever encountered in his life, and their relationship is one of fluctuating codependence, genuine affection, and love. But now let's take a run through the relationships Dexter attempts to develop with others over the course of this show, which will be a good starting point for our discussion of the real problems that Dexter faces throughout this series, his desire to fit in, and his constant search to discover who he truly is. And we'll start by talking about Rita. Rita is a damaged person, just like Dexter, albeit to a lesser degree. She suffered emotional, verbal, and physical abuse, both from her ex-husband and her mother. And as a result, she's a bit of an oddity herself, and a naive one at that. She's incredibly trusting and forgiving, and she isn't what you would call a confident or forceful person when we first encounter her, though this does change over time. For Dexter, Rita provides him with the human contact he desires, and his attachment to her kids, as well as the stability she provides in his otherwise unpredictable life, manages to push their relationship to the point of marriage once Rita becomes pregnant with Harrison. And though they have their struggles with Dexter's mysterious late-night activities and a bout of infidelity, overall, aside from his relationship with Deb, his relationship with Rita was the most healthy and genuine one he had over the course of his life. And on some level, Dexter truly loved Rita, but the differences between the two of them personality-wise formed a barrier between the two, and Rita was more an attempt from the light side of Dexter to form a meaningful relationship that was free from the horrors of his dark passenger. 
Rita is the soulmate of that Dexter, the woman that a Dexter uncorrupted by outside influences would have lived happily ever after with to the end of his days. The only other person who had any sort of normal relationship with Dexter was Camilla, the records office worker who had a close relationship with his family. And though initially, this seems like just another one of the relationships Dexter maintains for the sake of appearing as a normal human being, when Camilla is on her deathbed, we discover that Dexter actually had genuine feelings for her, didn't like having to help her commit suicide, and mourned her loss after she was gone. Unfortunately, aside from Deb, Rita, and Camilla, the deeper relationships Dexter tries to create with others all happen to be with people who are much more like his dark passenger than his true self. Now, the first person that tries to enter a relationship with him is actually a person who initiated that relationship in one of the most disgusting ways possible. His brother, Brian Moser, the ice truck killer. Initially fascinated with his brother's work, Dexter slowly discovers that the person behind these kills not only knows who he is, but is actively trying to lead Dexter to him, which includes hiding in plain sight by dating his sister. After an arduous journey towards discovering the identity of this mysterious fellow traveler, Brian finally reveals his true identity to Dexter at their childhood home. Here, Brian attempts to reveal what he believes to be Dexter's true self, his dark passenger, uninhibited by the limitations imposed upon him by Harry and Dr. Vogel. This is Dexter's first time connecting with a person who understands this part of him, aside from his father, and not only does his brother understand it, but he loves and encourages this aspect of his brother, goading him into shedding the false persona he's been forced to cultivate over the course of his life in favor of living in a world where Dexter and Brian Moser can unleash unrestricted hell together. And in order to do so, Brian believes it's necessary for Dexter to kill his sister so he can be free of his shackles. Thankfully, Dexter comes to his senses and kills Brian before he can cause harm to Dexter and his sister, but this would only be the beginning of curious people entering his life that would prod the beast within Dexter. And the next person to do so is Lila, a temptress who spies the oddity within Dexter from the moment she sets her sights on him. Courting disaster by engaging with Lila, Dexter and Lila are swept up into a whirlwind romance of infidelity, one in which Lila becomes so utterly obsessed with Dexter that she tries desperately to sabotage his relationship with Rita, and she even eventually kidnaps Aster and Cody in order to prove a point. Once again, Dexter manages to dispose of this unfortunate problem in his life, but the next rears its ugly head not long afterwards, that being Miguel Prado. Initially, their relationship seems to be an average one, and they connect on a platonic level that we rarely see. However, after Miguel finds Dexter outside the house where Freebo is hiding, the man who Miguel believed killed his brother Oscar, things start to change for the worse. Miguel evidently had the same idea as Dexter, albeit for a different reason, and after learning that Freebo was dealt with by Dexter, they only become closer. So much so, that Dexter starts letting Miguel into the dark side of his life in order to help him with his own urges, and potentially gain for himself a friend who he can be himself with. However, Miguel is a narcissist who can't bring himself to listen to anybody, and because of this, he strays from the code and begins to make Dexter's life a living hell, a hell that is once again averted when Dexter kills Miguel. For a long while after Miguel, Dexter had no one left to connect with at this level, and it wasn't until he met Lumen that he found someone who he could relate to again. Working as partners in crime, Dexter developed deep romantic feelings for Lumen, and the feeling was mutual until they finished murdering the men who had wronged her, after which Lumen's demons left her, and she could no longer identify with Dexter in this way, subsequently leaving him and putting Dexter in a state of despair at his continued lack of human connection. The next lucky person to develop a relationship with Dexter was Hannah, a woman who was equal parts Lila, Rita, and Lumen, a woman who had some of the dark tendencies that Dexter had, but one that didn't need to act on them to satisfy any urges. A person who wasn't completely insane, or afraid of who he was, a woman who accepted him and loved every part of him, a woman that Dexter would eventually sacrifice everything for to be with. The next person he tried to develop a connection with was the quack, who decided to turn him into a science experiment, Dr. Vogel, and their relationship was a maternal one of sorts, one that Dexter gained valuable knowledge from regarding his condition. The last person we see Dexter trying to make a relationship with is his son Harrison when he returns to him. But we'll talk about this relationship a little later on in this video. Now, if you'll notice, there's a pattern here. That being that Dexter is constantly trying to find people that he can relate to, both normally and abnormally. And this all ties back to Dexter's desire to find a place for himself amongst average human society and the suppression of his true self that was accomplished by his father and Dr. Vogel's efforts to shape him into something they assumed he was going to become. There's a few times during this series where Dexter philosophizes about this, stating that he feels like he's missing an integral 
integral part of the human experience, or that he wishes he lived in a post-apocalyptic world, where all the trappings of society are broken down, and there's no pressure to fit into any type of mold. He stated that he feels like no one could ever love him, and he says as much because no one knows, or understands, the true Dexter, not even Dexter. But now let's move on to what you've all been waiting for, examining whether or not Dexter is evil. And to do that, we obviously need to take a look at the many people that he kills, and why he kills them. Now Dexter's body count is exceptionally high, so we're going to discuss his career as a serial killer in three different categories, the guilty, the innocent, and the indirect. Beginning with the guilty, this section is going to be the shortest of the three, but it's important that we talk about the supposed honorable work that Dexter does in service to the code. Now there's a whopping 144 people that Dexter killed who fit into the parameters of the code, and dozens of other individuals who were threatened or assaulted by Dexter, but to cover every individual case would be rather redundant and inflate the length of this video unnecessarily. There are a few kills that are rather murky as far as the code is concerned, those being Esteban and Teo Gamosa, the drug dealers who were going to kill Sergeant Dokes, Norm, the hotel clerk who attempted to extort money from Dexter at gunpoint, and Alberto, the man who pulled a gun on Cuban migrants that he was transferring to the States. But these cases could be justified, depending on your point of view, and by whether or not these men committed other crimes in their past. But regardless, our main focus in examining Dexter's murderous behavior is to establish whether or not what he's doing is justified, how many innocent people are affected by his actions, and what alternatives there are to pursuing these killers in order to kill them. So for now, I'd simply like to point out that yes, almost every single one of these people definitely deserve to be punished severely, and the world is likely a better place without them. But we'll explore the merits of Dexter's adherence to the code once we've gone through the other categories I listed a moment ago. Moving on to the unfortunate people who became victims of Dexter Morgan that definitely did not deserve to die. First up, we have Oscar Prado, the man who happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time when Dexter was stalking Freebo. We have no way of knowing if Oscar was a murderer, but from what we do know, he was simply trying to score some drugs, which makes him far from being a person who deserves death. The next person was Nathan Martin, the sex offender who was taking photos of Aster at the beach. Obviously, not many people have much sympathy for people like Nathan Martin, but at the end of the day, he hadn't harmed anyone yet to our knowledge. And while he deserved some sort of punishment, killing him was not the appropriate way to handle this situation, and he definitely didn't fit into the parameters of the code. Next up is Jonathan Farrow, a man who had previously been arrested on suspicion of rape, and who Dexter thought was killing the women who modeled for his photo shoots. As it turns out, it was his assistant who was committing these murders, and Jonathan was innocent, and therefore, undeserving of death. Then there's Rankin, the man who Dexter killed for being bad-mannered and catching him at the wrong time. As after he insulted Dexter's recently deceased wife, Dexter thought it best to bludgeon him to death in response. Then we have Clint McKay, Hannah's father, who, while a total scumbag, didn't deserve to die for being a horrible father and a con man. Then there's Andrew Briggs, the man who Deb was involved with at the beginning of season 8, a man who was a thief and a hustler, but again, that isn't enough to warrant the death penalty. Last, we have Sergeant Logan, the officer that Dexter kills in the final episode of New Blood, who was simply in Dexter's way, a man who had not even a smidge of criminal intent in his body. The next category of people, the indirect, are much like the innocent, though there are exceptions, which I'll note when appropriate. We have Jenna Lincoln, the woman who Peter Thornton, in early cuts, kills because he's trying to emulate Dexter. Jason Reich, a man who could have been saved had Dexter acted upon his initial impulse to murder Jeremy Downs, but backed off because Jeremy claimed that his first victim had raped him. Paul Bennett, Rita's ex-husband, who Dexter framed in order to save Rita from his advances into her life. Paul was later murdered in prison after becoming agitated with another inmate, a situation that he never would have been in had it not been for Dexter. Ava Arenas, the woman killed on orders of Little Chino, had Dexter not faltered and killed him earlier, Ava's life would have been saved. The two victims of Ken Olson, a drug dealer and a wife beater, who were murdered because Ken was mimicking the Bay Harbor Butcher. Sergeant Dokes, a man who had done some questionable things during his tenure as a police officer, but ultimately didn't deserve to die. Ellen Wolfe, the rival of Miguel Prado, who was murdered after Miguel became Dexter's apprentice, a defense lawyer who was only doing her job that met her end because of it. Kyle Butler, a man who shared the same name as the alias Dexter used when interacting with the Trinity Killer. Rita, who died because Dexter wanted to pursue the Trinity Killer himself instead of helping his homicide unit solve the case. Trent Casey, the atheist professor who died for the same reasons as Rita. Tony Rush, Louis Green, Alex Dobrosny, Andres Rodriguez, Biggest Colombian, and the bartender at Mateo's all perished because Dexter killed Victor Baskov. 
though some of these men may have deserved to die when you consider their criminal backgrounds. Isaac Serko, who by all accounts deserved to die anyway, died because of his pursuit of Dexter. Maria LaGuerta, murdered by Deb in order to save her brother. Max Clayton, the U.S. Marshal who was hunting Hannah, gunned down by Oliver Saxon. And of course, Deborah Morgan, who died because of her brother's need to find and kill murderers himself. There's a possible unknown as well, that being the people that may have died during Hurricane Laura because Dexter delayed their flights, but that's a murky proposition at best. Regardless, we have a good amount of murders committed by Dexter directly or indirectly that were certainly unjustified and evil. But now we have to ask an important question. Are these murders forgivable when you consider how many lives were saved by Dexter due to his tireless effort to eliminate serial killers? The answer to that is technically yes, but not really. On the surface, it would seem that Dexter has done a lot more good than he has bad, but you have to consider that every innocent death that we can attribute to Dexter are all preventable, and murdering murderers and serial killers who got away or were never found isn't the best way to go about apprehending these people. And in fact, it's because Dexter feels compelled to kill these people that innocents die in the process. It's not as if Dexter is killing these people specifically because he's trying to make the world a better place. He's only killing them because it's the most effective way for him to satisfy his urge to kill without getting caught or harming innocents. So we can't even say that Dexter's intentions here are pure of heart. What really tells us that what Dexter is doing is wrong is the fact that most if not all of the criminals he kills could have been taken care of through legal means had he revealed his findings to his colleagues. And each innocent that died because of his desire to kill would still be alive. So if what Dexter is doing is ultimately wrong, what are the alternatives here? Well, as I mentioned earlier, it's likely that Dexter would have been able to overcome the multitude of disorders that were forced upon him through a combination of healthy family environment and therapy. And had this been the case, it's possible that he could have channeled his urges by entering a field that he's exceptionally talented in, investigation. Though Dexter is but a humble blood spatter analyst, his real talents lie in his innate ability to recognize devious behaviors in others, to see small details, and to think outside the box. He's always a step ahead of his colleagues, outpacing them on nearly every investigation involving a serial killer or murderer. Imagine if Dexter had been steered towards becoming a detective, a private investigator, or a bounty hunter, all professions that could potentially satisfy his need for violence. But rather than being a true outlet for him to unleash his dark desires, these professions could have been the end result of a child raised by an officer, a child who went through therapy to deal with his issues and came out the other side as a well-adjusted member of society. Dexter might have been better off becoming a PI or a bounty hunter rather than a detective because a good amount of the investigative work he conducts isn't exactly legal. But regardless, Dexter definitely had options, and not just options, but career paths that could have ensured Dexter Morgan became one of the most effective and respected investigators to ever live. And I'm sure this would have satisfied Dexter's need to be loved, accepted, and recognized as a human being of value. There's a few times throughout this series where we find Dexter fantasizing about being the hero, a titan of criminal investigation who gains the love and respect of the populace. He even contemplates at one point whether or not what he's doing is an act of heroism, the Dark Defender taking out the scum that plagues the city of Miami. But make no mistake, on the surface, it would seem that Dexter wants to be recognized for the dark deeds he does in service to the people, but that's not the case. He doesn't want to be idolized for his efforts because he views himself as some kind of twisted hero. He simply wants to be accepted for who he is. He wants people to appreciate the work he's done because that's what he's most proud of. He doesn't care if anyone recognizes his superb talents as a forensic specialist. He cares that people understand and accept what he believes to be his true self. This all ties back to Dexter wanting desperately to fit in, to be loved and accepted for who he is. And this would still be the case if Dexter were an artist or a mechanic. It's just unfortunate that who he is is a falsity, a manufactured persona forced upon him by his father and a deranged doctor. And his desire for his dark tendencies to be accepted isn't born out of the view that what he's doing and who he is is good, but out of his desire to just be accounted as a human amongst humans. However, it has to be said that Dexter does thoroughly enjoy his activities as a serial killer, even if he would like to be free from his urges and would choose not to be one if he could. And this is reflected in his persistent attempts to connect with others who are on the same level as him. But by the end of the series, Dexter comes to realize that much of the misfortune that surrounds the people in his life has been caused by him. And after experiencing a final heartbreak with the death of his sister, he decides to kill himself rather than continue to try and live a normal life. 
However, this doesn't go exactly as planned, as the most egregious attempted connection that Dexter tries to make ends up being the one he tries to make with Harrison after being reunited with him in New Blood. As though Dexter is initially worried that Harrison will become a monster like him, he becomes almost giddy when he learns that his son might be just like him. But still, if Dexter had the choice, he would choose to free himself from his dark passenger, and he wouldn't wish the horrors that it has brought him upon anyone, let alone his own family. Unfortunately though, Dexter never quite reaches that point. He experiences bouts of acceptance with various people, but in the end, Dexter's actions come full circle, and he gets what he likely deserved. And at this end, who was Dexter Morgan? He was a child who was forced to experience horrific trauma at the tender age of three, trauma that permanently altered his psyche for the worse. Forced into the role of a psychopath by his father and a crazed doctor, Dexter became a walking conundrum, a man who so desperately wished to be counted amongst the average populace, but a man who couldn't help but play the role given to him by trauma and indoctrination. Now with all the information we've been given about Dexter, can we definitely say that Dexter is an evil person? His actions certainly are. There's no denying that all of the murderous behavior of Dexter Morgan has impacted a significant number of innocents in horrific ways. And though he does kill people who by all means deserve to be punished in the most severe way possible, he does so for his own gratification. But Dexter is the product of trauma and the horrid indoctrination into the life of a serial killer, a man who was made to be evil by evil men who scarred him for life and a well-meaning father whose fear outweighed his sense when dealing with his son's issues. Dexter Morgan never wanted to be who he is, and though he tried several times to overcome the limitations placed upon him by everything he's been through, he was ultimately unable to shed who he was made to be. So, is Dexter evil? Yes and no. Things aren't always black and white. There are variations in every story that alter our view of who a person is and how they arrived at that point. And though Dexter Morgan certainly sowed his fair share of evil, when it comes down to it, he's a shining example of one of the horrific realities of our world. No one is born evil. They either choose to be evil or they're bred to be evil. And though Dexter certainly had a choice in committing his crimes, we can't ignore the fact that he had little to no choice in becoming the man he is. And that, my friends, is unfortunately one of the greatest sources of all the world's evil. Thank you all for tuning into this episode of Analyzing Evil, and I hope you've enjoyed. What are your thoughts on Dexter? Did I miss anything? Let me know down below, and leave a suggestion for a villain you'd like to see featured while you're at it. If you like this video, hit that thumbs up button, and make sure to subscribe if you haven't already. Also, I've recently launched new merchandise that features this beautiful design you're seeing on screen now, that I'm sure a lot of you will love. You can find a link to my store down below to learn more. A big thank you to all of my subscribers, and to my patrons, and a most vile thank you to those whose names you're seeing on screen now. Join the channel's Discord server and Reddit to interact with myself and the community. And follow me on the social media platforms listed below to keep up with the channel. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll be seeing you soon.